and try to answer the question, is there still a place for HFOV? Um, these are my conflicts of interest to disclose, although uh, none of them are really related to the topic of this talk, so we can move on quickly. Um, but before I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on high frequency, um, I'm going to be a little bit chauvinistic and tell you that the artificial respiration is not something really new and it's something that comes out of my country because of the, uh, we have a lot of waters, so we had a lot of drowning victims in the medieval ages. And I would everybody uh, encourage to read this chapter in the uh, Martin Tobin book, Principles of Practical Mechanical Ventilation, because it's a really nice history. But if you go back at the medieval ages, what did we do with the drowning victims? Well, we kept the patient warm. That is something that we still do nowadays. Uh, we gave artificial respiration through the mouth in those days. We still do that nowadays. Um, and they fumigated the rectum with tobacco smoke, tried to uh, resuscitate and revive the drowning victim. And if that didn't help, they placed stimulants orally and rectally. And if that didn't help, well, they did uh, uh, bleeding and then hoped that the patient would survive, which of course wasn't the case. Well, over the years, we have gained much, much more knowledge, but some things uh, still happen by, uh, by accident. Um, and this also relates to high frequency osteo ventilation. And this is a really nice uh, paper in the Blue Journal, about 20 years old now, written by Professor Charlie Bryan from SickKids in Toronto, uh, describing how he came across high frequency osteo ventilation. And he was quite honest and said, listen, I, we stumbled onto high frequency by mistake because they were doing a study where they were uh, measuring the effects of muscle relaxants uh, on lung impedance. Uh, and they set up the, the equipment for the studies and they stuck a CO2 probe in the circuit. And he, they couldn't explain why they did it, but they did. And then they found at each breath hold, CO2 appeared in the mouthpiece in increasing amounts with each beats of the loudspeaker, eventually reaching entire levels. So with a loudspeaker system, they were able to uh, ventilate uh, uh, an animal. And this is what one of the first oscillators looked like. Um, and the basic principle hasn't changed over those years because for conventional mechanical ventilation, if you look at the pressure time scaler, uh, you see this typical uh, waveform on your screen with a peak inspiratory pressure, uh, a positive end expiratory pressure if set. Um, and the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the PEEP is the, the, the delta pressure. Um, and you can calculate the mean error pressure. Well, with high frequency austere ventilation, of course, uh, if you look at the scaler, you deliver a much higher a mean airway pressure uh, and superimposed on that mean airway pressure are uh, oscillations and really small oscillations with a stroke volume that is below that space or so below 2 ml per kg at a rate between 3 and 15 hertz. So it's really much different from, uh, from conventional mechanical ventilation. Um, and early studies, experimental work showed that high frequency was quite a easy way to ventilate because it decoupled oxygenation and ventilation. Um, and if you look at this uh, graph over here, you see the PO2 plotted uh, for a mean area pressure uh, in animals uh, before lavage and post lavage. And at some point when the lungs started to recruit, you see a very nice linear relationship between the ox PAO2 um, and the uh, mean area pressure. Um, and on the deflation limb, there was a linear relationship, but it was much more flat over a prolonged time, making use of histories of the lung. And this concept is important uh, because it comes back later on in the talk. Um, and they didn't observe such a relationship for ventilation. Um, but the mechanisms of a gas exchange, they are really complex. And it they all have to do with how the pressure that is generated by the oscillator is delivered to the uh, alveolar level. And this oscillatory pressure transmission, it depends on compliance uh, and resistance of the respiratory system. Because as you can see in this really nice uh, uh, cartoon, we have two different alveoli, one that is well compliant and one that is poorly compliant. And in the one that is poorly compliant, there are larger pressure swings at alveolar level compared with the uh, good compliance uh, alveolus. Um, and it's very nicely displayed in this graph. So with a decrease in compliance, the delta P, so the amplitude, so the pressure, uh, oscillatory pressure amplitude increases. With resistance, 
before a resistance, uh, because here you have an array resistance, let's say in a bronchiolitis patient or some other viral pneumonia patients. So before the uh, airway narrowing, there is a larger oscillatory pressure um, and more distal from the uh, resistance, there is a dampened uh, pressure swing. So there's attenuation of the pressure wave. <clears throat> and this is really nicely shown in this graph. And if you look at the orange line, it is the alveolar line, uh, and this is the uh, tracheal line. So the amplitude that the oscillator generates, how much is seen by the alveolus is dependent on the compliance and the resistance of the respiratory system. And this is one of the already take home messages early on in the part, because what we have been taught traditionally with oscillating patients is that we should set a amplitude. We use the amplitude to uh, manipulate ventilation. But if you take these physical concepts into mind, then you would see that the, the amplitude should be seen as a monitoring parameter and not as a parameter that you should set. The big question, of course, is why should you oscillate? We have learned so much more of lung protective ventilation. And I think the previous presentation by Professor Rimsberger was from such excellent uh, talk. It really showed all these, these components. Um, but let's try to summarize them in this graph. So here we have a pressure volume loop with pressure on the x-axis and volume on the y-axis. And here you have the inflation limb, which is the red line, and the deflation limb, which is the green line. And one immediately sees that these are not superimposed on each other because there is hysteresis of the lung. Um, and we know from experimental work that on the inflation limb, there is a continuous recruitment and de-recruitment going on. Um, and on the deflation limb, this is less prominent, but this means that the so-called safe zone of ventilation, so where you can ventilate your patient without being, with being the least injurious, is really, really small. And traditionally, this cartoon was displayed with a safe zone, which is really this big, but we know on the inflation limb that there is continuous recruitment, de recruitment. So the safe zone is mainly located on the deflation limb of the pressure volume loop. And we've learned over the years that we don't want to be in the upper part of the pressure volume loop because we don't want to cause over distension by large tidal volumes, uh, because then you get a rupture of the alveolar capillary membrane. And we don't want to be in the lower part of the pressure volume loop because then you have lung areas that are still uh, collapsed, as you can actually see in this image. You see lung areas that are open and there are lung areas that are still collapsed. And this is also injurious, which is atelect trauma. So we need to balance between atelect trauma and volume trauma uh, by, well, delivering a small tidal of volume, uh, but nobody knows how small small is. And by uh, delivering, you know, by setting an optimal level of PEEP, but nobody knows what the optimal level of PEEP is. Um, and I will go through this quickly because uh, Professor Rimsberger already told this, but the allowable tidal volume depends on the compliance of the lung, which is compatible with the baby lung concept. So if you have a patient who has a moderate ARDS, uh, the, tar the tidal volume that you can deliver is larger than in a patient with a severe ARDS where the lung is less compliant and the tidal volume is, uh, is much smaller because the safe zone becomes much smaller. This landmark paper published in, in 2000 by the ADAS network showed that delivering large side of volume, 12 mm per kg, was associated uh, uh, with a higher mortality compared with delivering 6 mL per kg. So everybody says, okay, lung protective ventilation uh, until 6 mL per kg, that's fine because 12 mL per kg is bad. Um, and yes, of course, the uh, mortality uh, uh, benefit was quite impressive, going from 40% to 31%. But it doesn't mean that 6 mL per kg is the holy grail and is the type of volume that one should deliver. Because there is a group of patients that still suffer from over distension with 6 mL per kg. And this really nice study uh, from uh, Tarakni and Chumelo published in 2007 um, highlight this phenomena. So they have patients uh, with ARDS ventilated according to uh, current standards, so 6 mL per kg, PEEP setting according to the PEEP FO2 grid. And then when these patients were placed in the CT scanner and measuring uh, the uh, overextension at the uh, uh, end of inspiration, in some patients, 6 mL per kg was fine. And these patients didn't have end inspiratory tidal hyperinflation. But another group of patients 
not detectable from the outside, still had regional uh, and inspiratory tidal hyperinflation, meaning that six mL for these per kg for these patients was still too much and the tidal volume should be lower, which is of course compatible with the baby lung concept. So the sicker the lung, the lower the compliance, the lower the tidal volume should be. Um, this would mean uh, high frequency would be uh, the way to go, but it's much questioned by many people saying high frequency is the end of the road. But the question is, do we really know how to use the oscillator in a good way? And uh, if you don't do a trial properly, uh, then you can uh, ruin a really good technique. Let's go back to the question, do we really know how to use high frequency oscillator ventilation? Well, let's go back to the paper from, from Professor Charlie Bryan. And this was a Find quite fascinating statement somewhere in this paper saying, well, you could do randomized controlled trials, but she said, well, I was allergic to randomized controlled trials because it was now clear that we were testing the driver and not the machine. So with the RCT for high frequency, the threat is that you're not testing the technique itself, but you're testing how it is applied by people. And the only thing to overcome this is education. Um, but then you have the one of the most famous scientists from the world, Richard B. Feynman, an American physicist, said, well, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, but if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So you can say that high-frequency oscillator ventilation um, is a good mode of ventilation for patients with severe lung injury, but if the experiments, so the trials, if they don't show it, then your theory is, is wrong. Well, let's take a close look at the so-called experiment, because when people are talking about high frequency, it's not, it's, it's not, high frequency doesn't mean high frequency, it's, it's not the same. The success of high frequency depends on the patient, depends on the oscillator, how it is set, and depends on the operator, the one who sets the oscillator. So find the right patient, uh, use the oscillator by physiology, uh, and change your mindset. So forget what you have learned about high frequency uh, uh, over the past years. Well, first selecting the patient. Well, the indications for high frequency, in my view, they are quite easy. I don't want this patient to die. And I think many people still use high frequency in that fashion uh, all over the world as a rescue intervention. But you could also change your mindset a little bit and think, okay, I don't want ventilator settings, conventional ventilator settings to become toxic. So if you are reaching a certain plateau pressure, you don't want to go above that certain plateau pressure because we know it's associated with injury. Hence, maybe moving to the oscillator. Personally, I think the oscillator is much easier to use because it had fewer knobs, um, but that's just my, my thing. And some people have asked, well, can you identify a proper patient using oxygenation parameters? Well, many people use oxygenation index as a threshold. We don't have a clear clear value, which is a, 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 a when to use the oscillator or not. Um, but the adults have shown from a sub-analysis of their oscillate trial that if the patient has a baseline PF ratio below 100, there is most likely a benefit on outcome in those who are managed with the oscillator. So in severe ARDS, high frequency oscillator ventilation uh, may improve patient outcome. The second aspect is let physiology guide the oscillator. So the current use of the oscillator is a, a cookbook. Many people set the oscillator frequency by weight, uh, set the amplitude looking at chest wiggle or looking at CO2. Uh, many people don't use a real lung volume optimization strategy. Um, and even the RCTs don't make use of physiology. So it's a real cookbook approach. And I think uh, this is something that we should throw out of the window. Because frequency, so the frequency of the oscillator it has nothing to do with weight, it has nothing to do with age, but it has everything to do with lung mechanics. Um, and it's a quite complicated and, and we only have 30 minutes, but if you take the concept of resonance frequency in mind and you uh, um, uh, trying to find the frequency at which the pressure cost of ventilation is the lowest, meaning that at that frequency, the injurious effects of ventilation are the lowest, that's the frequency that one should target during HFOV. Um, and this optimal frequency depends on the so-called corner frequency. And the corner frequency is a frequency and, and it's a formula. It's, influenced by compliance and resistance. 
And those are easy things we can see at the bedside. Look at this graph. So here you have the lung impedance, the pressure cost of ventilation, and here you have the frequency. This is the line for a normal patient. This dot represents the corner frequency. At this point, the pressure cost is, of ventilation is the lowest, meaning the injurious effects of ventilation are the lowest. In patients with a decreased compliance, so those with ARDS, the corner frequency shifts to the right. Look at the formula, the number becomes lower, so the corner frequency goes up, meaning that in patients with ARDS, you should go in the higher range of frequencies. So if you have, let's say, a eight-year-old patient, don't set the frequency at eight hertz because the patient is eight years old. No, if the patient has ARDS, go at 12 or 15. For patients with increased airway resistance, so the, the as status asthmaticus, it's quite the opposite. They need a lower frequency because with increasing resistance, the corner frequency shifts to the left, meaning that the frequency that you should set should be lower. But for ARDS patients, so for those with a decreased compliance, um, you should target the highest frequency possible. Many people when they go to the oscillator, they don't do a recruitment strategy. And experimental work really shows the necessity, of, underscores the necessity of a long volume optimization maneuver. So here you have the volume above FRC for a mean airway pressure, conventional mechanical ventilation, high frequency, just setting a pressure doing nothing, and then doing a long volume uh, recruitment maneuver. Uh, and with increasing pressure over time, you see that with the ones who are recruited, there is a greater degree of lung aeration, so more lung recruitment. Um, and in those with a uh, more lung volume uh, recruitment, there is a lower degree of lung injury. So a lower deposition of hyaline membranes as marker of lung injury um, and a lower degree of epithelial injury. And this is because with a recruited lung, the pressure amplitude is smaller than with a non-recruited lung, as we saw in the beginning. So this really underscores the need for opening up the lung when you have gone to the oscillator. And another benefit of doing a lung volume optimization maneuver is that you can make use of hysteresis of the lungs. Um, and this is really nicely shown in this graph. So with, we are increasing the pressure in this patient and the lung is opening up, opening up. Um, and then when we are decreasing the pressure again, when we are on the deflation limb, one immediately sees that for the same pressure on the deflation limb, the lung is aerated versus a non-aerated lung on the inflation limb. So a lung volume optimization maneuver not only attenuates lung injury, but also allows you to have the lung more recruited and in the end in requiring less pressure. Lung recruitment is a time-consuming technique, and that's why the adults use the so-called 40-40 rule in their trials. And with the 40-40 rules, what they did was they applied 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds. And by doing that, they hoped to have fully recruited the lungs. And then they set the initial mean airway pressure at 30 centimeters of water, hoping to be at the safe zone of ventilation. And this is a, uh, a maneuver that takes, well, let's say two minutes max. But the, the problem is, um, if you have a patient with a severe ARDS, where the pressure volume loop is flattened, it's the inflection points are shifted to the right, the hysteresis is, is gone. And if you would then apply 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds and reduce your pressure to 30, you would get a significant de-recruitment. And for another patient, applying 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds and then going back to 30 would mean that this patient would still be in overdistension. So a sustained inflation ignores the individual respiratory system mechanics of the patient um, and is in my view, not, the, uh, not a good lung volume uh, recruitment uh, technique. What would then be a good technique? Well, the problem is we don't have that much data. We have this really nice neonatal lamp uh, study uh, from a Peter Dargaville's group um, uh, comparing a 
incremental uh, mean area pressure titration to recruit the lungs versus a sustained dynamic inflation or repeat dynamic inflation. Um, and they measured our control and they measured the rhetoric gas volume um, and they performed single slice CT scanning in all those animals. And what they found was that the escalating recruit maneuver, so staircase incremental mean area pressure titration resulted in the greatest lung aeration um, with the lowest proportion of a poorly aerated lung. So a stepwise incremental mean area pressure titration to find the best mean area pressure for your patient when you have gone to the oscillator um, seems uh, indicated at this uh, moment. Then back to the amplitude, as I said in the beginning, well, amplitude, the delta P, what you see on your screen is not the same as power because the power is a dimensionless knob that drives the piston. Um, and the piston, the movement of the piston generates a amplitude and that amplitude depends on the compliance and the resistance of the respiratory system, uh, as I showed you in the beginning. So this means that you should use the amplitude as a marker and not as a setting. So the amplitude gives you information what is going on with your patient. But this is all theory, but the problem is that the data uh, contradicts our theory and this is the um, one of the most cited studies in that context that is the uh, oscillate trial from uh, Neil Ferguson and Deborah Cook uh, from Canada um, which was by design a very nice trial uh, because for the high frequency approach they well they, they reported the 4040 rule which made some criticism uh, but it was really protocolized um, um, but the control group was also really protocolized and the control group was based on experiences uh, with um, a, a recruitment uh, study and uh, the last trial. Um, so it was a consensus for the frequency approach versus a more or less proven approach for the conventional uh, mechanical ventilation. But the problem with that trial was that although it was really nicely designed, that in the end uh, they didn't achieve very high frequency, although it was in the protocol, the frequencies that were uh, uh, that were achieved with 5.5 hertz, which would mean really large side of volume in these adults, they managed oxygenation by a MAP FI2 table. Um, and a MAP FI2 table is a um, is based on the PEEP FI2 grid. And although there is some data from CHLA showing that it, there's a signal to in, in patient outcome, the PEEP FI2 grid and this grid are non-validated grids uh, and they have nothing to do with physiology. Uh, and I said the control group was strictly protocolized. So the trial by itself, the design was okay, but the signal was not there. And this trial was stopped prematurely after 550 patients um, because the mortality in the high frequency group was significantly higher compared to the, um, compared to the control group. Um, and it was death in hospital, it was death in the ICU, it was death for 28 days. Uh, what's worse in the high frequency group compared with the control group? Interestingly, these patients did not die from refractory hypoxemia. Uh, because as you can see that the refractory hypoxemia was significantly lower in the high frequency group compared to the control group. Uh, confirming what Professor Rimmersberg said that hypoxemia doesn't kill you. Other studies combined the uh, two uh, uh, the two adult trials uh, with high frequency um, um, and uh, older adult trials stratified by tidal volume find uh, didn't find a, a effect of high frequency over conventional mechanical ventilation uh, in adults with ARDS. So. Does it still have a place? Well, the, the theory says yes, but the adult data uh, isn't that supportive. Well, this is the 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 the, the MAP FR2 grid, uh, and it's had nothing to do with physiology. The problem is that we don't have really good pediatric data. There is only one randomized controlled trial published by John Arnold in 1994, uh, a, a randomized crossover trial of only 60 patients, um, and they didn't find a mortality benefit of high frequency over conventional mechanical ventilation. Um, they did find that there was a lower need for oxygen at 30 days, but that's not a real strong objective uh, criterion. So no mortality uh, uh, benefit. And then it became quiet for, for many, many years uh, until this uh, uh, 
analysis of a database was published by uh, uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Wetzel from Los Angeles. Um, and they analyzed data from the virtual PICU database uh, and matched patients using a propensity score because uh, it's a database study. Um, but unfortunately, this database was not having any information on lung mechanical ventilators and expiring high frequency nor did it mention how high frequency was used. So they were only able to examine the outcomes associated with high frequency and conventional. And they found that there was a much higher mortality and a much more time on the ventilator in those who were managed with the oscillator. And it didn't matter if it were all patients or if it were those patients who were managed earlier with high frequency. In each analysis, high frequency was associated with adverse outcomes, so a higher mortality and a longer time on the ventilator. The problem with this study is that there are so many unknowns and so many confounding variables that have not been adjusted for that it is probably not, uh, not right to state that high frequency doesn't have a place based on this pediatric study. Conclusions by the article itself, they were stated too boldly, and the propensity matching uh, for this propensity matching, if you don't know what propensity matching is, one the one of the serious concerns of bias in database studies is so-called confounding by indication. Confounding by indication means that the patient who is the most sick is the most likely to get a specific, uh, certain intervention, um, uh, and you have to adjust for that. So you can adjust for propensity matching, and, and propensity is the likelihood that a patient is getting a certain intervention based on vari variables that one identifies. For this propensity matching, which is nothing but a logistic regression analysis, you have to put in variables in your model that make sense and that have to do with the decision-making when to start high frequency. So let's say peak and sphere during pressure, unconventional, FI2 unconventional, uh, timing, et cetera, et cetera. But because all of this data was lacking in the virtual picket database, the authors used variables for propensity matching that had nothing to do with the decision-making when to start high frequency. So the discussion on high frequency is really, really troubled by this uh, particular study. Uh, some of these limitations were addressed by Scott Bateman and Martha Curley, who performed a, uh, a secondary analysis of the RESTORE data set. The RESTORE study was a trial uh, comparing uh, sedation approaches um, in the pediatric ventilated patients. Um, and they uh, uh, studied the effects of high frequency versus conventional by comparing early versus CMV. Um, and they did not find increased mortality with high frequency, but they did find a prolonged time on the ventilator. So the really strong uh, uh, effects as observed by the Gupta study were not uh, confirmed, but indeed patients who were managed with high frequency spent more time on the ventilator, even adjusting after adjusting for disease severity and all other known, uh, conf uh, known confounders. So the uh, duration of the mechanical ventilation, for example, was 15 days in the high frequency group versus 10 days in the conventional group. So again, brings back the question, is it the end of the road? No, well, we have, uh, we don't know how to use the oscillator in a good sense. And this is something that has also been addressed by uh, Neil Ferguson in this really nice uh, review article in Current Being Critical Care. Because if you are going to use the oscillator, you have to balance frequency, you have to find your mean error pressure, and you have to find the optimal mean error pressure. And if you don't find the optimal mean error pressure, so if there's no balance between over extension and recruitment, you get all these negative side effects. The frequency, if you don't use the highest frequency possible, you are going to deliver larger tidal volumes than anticipated, and you are going to uh, attenuate the potential uh, lung protective effect of the oscillator. So we try to summarize these differences in high frequency approach uh, in this paper and coined it high frequency 2.0 and high frequency 2.0 means an open lung strategy oscillation on the deflation limb by doing a steroid recruitment maneuver in all patients the highest possible frequency for example in our unit we start at 12 hertz in all patients irrespective of age or weight or on the, uh, uh, or cause of the ARDS and we, a high fixed power setting. So targeting an initial proximal pressure amplitude of 70 to 90 in all patients, and then using the proximal pressure amplitude as a marker of what's going on in your patient. When you do recruitment, many people are afraid of pressure. Um, and the question is how high do you need to go with pressure? Well, we characterized all the recruitment maneuvers we have done. Um, and, and we found that the um, 
lung was open uh, at a mean air pressure uh, optimal of about 28 centimeters of water. Um, and to achieve this 20 centimeters, 28 centimeters of water, we had to go up to a median of 37 centimeters of water with the IQR 34, 38 to find this optimal mean air pressure at the end of the maneuver. Meaning that if you have a patient on conventional and you're going to have frequency, you should not be afraid of pressure and you really need to crank up the pressure to really open up the lung. Um, so in summary for that, open up the lung uh, with about 26 to 34, sorry, 34 to 48 centimeters of water. And then you, in, you find your optimum and average pressure somewhere between 26 and 34. And if you know these numbers, if you see these numbers and these come from the characterization of about 50 to 60 individual lung volume uh, recruitment maneuvers, then you already understand that a so-called 40-40 rule and then going back to 30 uh, may be of benefit in some patients, but you ignore many, many other patients. This um, high frequency 2.0 approach, so high frequency, high fixed power setting, uh, open lung, is it safe and does it work? Well, uh, one of our uh, PhD students, one of our attendings, uh, uh, collected the data on all these patients, 115 children over a three year period, of whom uh, about 20% had severe ARDS. Um, and I said it's a high initial frequency in all patients, high initial uh, delta P in all patients, uh, and all patients underwent a staircase incremental uh, mean air pressure titration, which is a lung recruitment maneuver which takes about 45 minutes, but it only one that allows us for an individual setting of the mean air pressure. Um, and we could show that it indeed was feasible because, well, we used high pressure in all those patients and it did decrease over time. These are hours, so a six hour, 12 hour, 24 hours, 36, 72 hours. Uh, but it was irrespective of what kind of ARDS the patient had high pressure. We were able to maintain an amplitude of 70 to 90 in all these patients during the first three days and a frequency that never went below eight hertz. So really compatible with the corner frequency concept. And although you would say, okay, this is a really high frequency and this is really high pressure, what about oxygenation ventilation? Well, oxygenation ventilation would, works really well with this new approach. So here you have the oxygenation index or the PF ratio, and you see uh, when you go to the oscillator, an increase in oxygenation index, which makes sense because we use high mean air pressure because of our open lung concept. But especially in those with severe areas, you see a really strong improvement in OI uh, over time. Uh, and uh, a strong improvement in PF ratio over time. Um, and despite having this high frequency, we were able to really adequately ventilate the patient because the CO2 was, and the gray box represents the conventional on this high frequency, the, gray, the CO2 was even within normal limits um, when the patients were on the oscillator, despite the frequencies above uh, uh, eight to 10 Hertz. Um, and the pH was in the normal range as well, suggesting that we, might have even gone uh, going higher with our frequency. So this new, this alternative approach, it improves oxygenation, especially in severe parts, and it gives a good CO2 clearance despite the high frequency. And it doesn't have any effect on hemodynamics. In fact, certified by age, we saw a normalization of the heart rate. We saw a normalization of the central venous pressure. We didn't see an increase in uh, uh, um, or a decrease in a mean arterial blood pressure. And we didn't see an increase in, um, uh, in lactate, indicating that this open lung approach by really opening up the lung, um, giving high pressures didn't uh, uh, cause a hemodynamic compromise. And it was also irrespective of part severity. It all sounds very easy, but the device itself, it doesn't have a, a brain. This sticker should be on your device, so you have to use your own brain. So if you were to summarize where we are today now with high frequency, well, we can say that a premature trial can kill a good technique, or at least almost. We've seen it happen with the neonatal trials early on, and now we've seen it happen with the two adult trials. Mindsets are harder to change than machines. So this high frequency 2.0 is completely opposite of what many people has, have been taught for over many, many years. So changing the mindset, that's going to take some time. Um, and ventilator strategy must be driven by patient pathology and not by a cookbook. Uh, 
but hopefully we are going to get an answer uh, about high frequency auditory ventilation. So right now, the PROSPECT trial is being conducted, uh, a trial being led by Martha Curley, Ira Chaifetz, and myself, which is a two by two factorial trial uh, comparing high frequency versus conventional and prone versus supine position in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. Uh, and we hope to have you show you the results uh, uh, in, in three or four years' time. Uh, and this is the trial uh, in brief. So, what should you do in practice? Well, right now, high frequency, yes, use it and follow the guidelines because the PALEC, as already cited by Professor Rimmersberger, well, consider high frequency as an alternative ventilatory mode, not as a rescue mode, but as an alternative ventilatory mode um, when you are reaching toxic conventional ventilator settings. Uh, and PEMVEC more or less says the same. And, and if you do that, use a open lung strategy to maintain optimal lung volume. So no data to abandon the oscillator for parts at this stage. It can be considered in case of moderate to severe oxygenation and or ventilation difficulties with potentially or already present toxic conventional ventilator settings. And the big issue with high frequency is that it's not the oscillator per se, but rather how we use it. Um, and in contrast to what everybody has been taught, I really advocate high frequency, not dictated by 808, a staircase recruitment maneuver um, and using the amplitude as a monitoring parameter and not to target a specific delta P. And I'm st still convinced that high frequency is the ultimate uh, tidal volume strategy, it's the ultimate long protective ventilation strategy. But it's true, uh, we need to learn how to manage the uh, oscillation in an optimal fashion. Uh, and I hope with this talk, it will help you a little bit towards that uh, direction. Thank you very much.